Today's story will talk about the kidnapping of Barbara Mackle. At the time, late 1968, she was 20 years old, studying economics at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. She was dating a boy named Stuart Hunt Woodward, and was the daughter of Jane and Robert Mackle. They were millionaires and lived in Miami, Florida. Robert owned the Deltona Corporation, one of the largest family-owned real estate construction companies in the United States. Robert was also a friend of Richard Nixon, who was soon to become President of the United States, having built him a property that would serve as Nixon's Winter White House. All in all, Barbara was from a very well-connected family. In December of that year, several people were getting a very bad flu, known at the time as the Hong Kong flu. Barbara was one of those who had the flu. December was exam month at college, so she was going through a very delicate time trying to juggle her studies and her health. So, her mother Jane decided to leave Miami and go to Atlanta to help her daughter with food and housework while she concentrated on her exams. Then, on December 3rd, Jane rented a motel room and Barbara left the student residence. Two weeks later, on December 17th at 3am, someone knocked on the motel room door. Who is it? Sorry to bother you at this time, but is Barbara there? Her boyfriend Stuart was in a car accident and he's in the hospital. <gasps> Jane saw through the window that the man was dressed in police clothes and she decided to open the door. When the man entered, he pointed a gun at Jane and another, much smaller man entered the room. In a quick act, they attacked her, using a cloth with chloroform, a chemical that quickly makes a person faint, to immobilize her. With the noise, Barbara woke up. They tied Jane up, gagged her, and pulled Barbara to a car that was parked outside the bedroom door. They took her to the middle of a forest that was more than 30 kilometers away. There, the men took her out of the car and led her to a grave. Inside the grave was a kind of aquarium the size of a person. Barbara realized that she would be placed alive there, in that hole. As she looked more clearly at what was in that glass box, she saw a blanket, a sweater, a small fan, air vents, sanitary supplies, a small light, water, and food. Unbeknownst to her, the water had sedatives in it to make her sleep most of the time. The kidnapper then calmly explained what exactly was going on. This is a kidnapping. We need you to get into that box. We won't hurt you. We just want a ransom from your family. But if you want money, I can get it for you now. That's not a problem. That's not how it works. Why don't you leave me in a house? Don't put me in there for God's sake. Well, we need to make sure you don't run away. It's going to be okay. We didn't choose you at random. We know you're a strong girl. I'm not going in there! Come on, Barbara. Come in. As Barbara was not cooperating, the men again used the cloth with chloroform to make her pass out and then put her in the box. As part of the chloroform had already been evaporated, it was no longer as efficient, and this caused Barbara to just calm down, but not pass out. So they laid her down in the glass case and took a picture of her holding a sign that read, Kidnapped. They demanded that she smile for the picture so that her parents would know from seeing it that she was still alive. After it was taken, they closed the capsule and began to cover it with dirt. Inside the box, the kidnappers left a written note with a detailed set of instructions for her to follow. The note started with, Do not be alarmed. You are safe. You are presently inside a fiberglass reinforced plywood capsule buried beneath the ground near the house in which your kidnappers are staying. Your status will be checked approximately every two hours. This note was very extensive, including warnings of failsafe measures installed by Gary to prevent Barbara from attempting to break out of the cage, and even reference to a box of candy left there to give her energy. You can read the note in full at the link in the description. After a few hours, there in the motel room, Jane woke up 
managed to free herself and immediately called the police. Then she called her husband Robert in Florida and finally Stuart, which is when she found out that there had been no accident with him at all. Barbara's father, being a very influential man, contacted the FBI directly. On the morning of the same day, the criminal called Robert's house in Miami. This is Barbara's kidnapper. Pay close attention. She's buried somewhere. What? Calm down. She's fine. She can breathe and there's food for her. What do you mean? It doesn't matter. What you need to know now is, if you don't act fast, she could die. Get a pen and paper. The ransom would cost you $500,000. Do not involve the police. For me to know that you are willing to pay this amount, you will need to advertise in the Miami newspapers. My love, please come home. We will pay all expenses and meet you anywhere, anytime. Signed, your family. Right, right, right. But what week newspaper? Every newspaper. I don't know which newspaper I'm going to pick up tomorrow. If you don't do that or involve the police, you will never know where she is buried. Robert obeyed all instructions, and the ad came out the next day, December 18th. And with that, after Barbara had spent practically 30 hours buried, with the flu, without medical treatment, the kidnappers saw the newsletter in the newspaper and returned to Robert to explain their requirements for the payment and for the rescue. Robert, I saw the advertisement in the papers, but I see everywhere that your daughter was kidnapped. I told you not to involve the police. No, 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 wait, wait, the police know because I told them on the day of the kidnapping. They don't know that you called me. They don't know about the rescue. They don't know anything. I'm cooperating here. <sighs> Robert wasn't lying. No newspaper quoted the ransom amount or the fact that Barbara was buried. All right, Robert. You're doing great. Now look at this. I want the $500,000 in cash... I don't want tens, I don't want fifties, I said twenties. Now here's a time and address that will meet this evening. Robert went to several banks to try to withdraw the amount, as it was practically impossible to withdraw $500,000 in a single place and without prior notice. For you guys to have an idea of what this value represents today, it's equivalent to about $3.5 million. And he asked for it in $20 notes. Robert wrote down the serial number of the $25,020 notes so that in the future he could track the kidnapper. Later in the afternoon, having had trouble finding the exact location the kidnapper had informed him of, Robert finally managed to leave the briefcase in the right spot. Minutes later, a man appeared, took the money, and left. As this man walked towards a car, he saw some police nearby and, scared, decided to run. They were the local Miami police, not the FBI, and with this suspicious attitude, and not knowing what was going on, the police began to chase the suspect, who, during his escape, dropped his suitcase and managed to flee through the trees in the middle of the forest. The police couldn't find him, but they returned to search the car and inside, they found a photo of Barbara holding the kidnap sign. Tracking information from the vehicle, the police identified the owner as Gary Stephen Christ, 23 years old, and found a key to a motel room that was at the same place where Barbara was staying when she was kidnapped. In the motel's registry, the record was in the name of another man, soon discovered to be a false name, and a 26-year-old woman named Ruth Eisman Shear. This woman, in fact, was the accomplice of the kidnapping, who at dawn on the 17th had disguised herself as a man to hinder possible future searches, but committed the simple failure of giving her real name at the motel's check-in. Gary had already been arrested for previous crimes and was currently on the run. He had worked at the Marine Science Institute in Miami and because of that he had knowledge in building high strength aquariums. There at the institute he had found a design of a human aquarium plus information about a battery based ventilation system. Since the police and FBI didn't know anything they assumed that Barbara had simply been buried alive. Ruth was a biologist born in Honduras who spoke English, Spanish, German and French and never had any involvement with the police until she fell in love with Gary. The two together, without realising it, engineered the most famous kidnapping in the United States until that date. 
Gary was now the FBI's second most wanted fugitive, and Ruth the first woman to ever make the FBI most wanted list. The next day, the 19th, after Barbara had spent approximately 55 hours buried, her family received an envelope with the same photo that the police had found in the car. Desperate, Robert paid newspapers and radios to report that he had not notified the police, that this was just a misunderstanding and he had followed all previously agreed upon instructions. He just wanted his daughter back and was willing to make another rescue, paying all the money again. He asked for a second chance and pleaded that he just wanted his daughter back. Gary heard the message on the radio and at 10.35pm he called Robert. I've seen your message Robert. I'll give you one more chance. Don't involve the police. After I get the case, I'll get back to you at noon to tell you where your daughter's buried. That same day, Gary successfully managed to get the ransom money. Robert waited for the new call, which actually never came to him directly. In the early morning of the 20th, with Barbara buried almost 80 hours, Gary called the telephone exchange and spoke directly to a telephone operator. I have information on where this kidnapped girl's buried. Okay, I'll transfer your call to the police. Don't do that. You're gonna take down the information. If you try to transfer my call, I'll hang up and I'll never return. The operator wrote down all the information and immediately called the police. But, as he had been in negotiations with Robert, Gary was not precise in the details of the location, which made it difficult to quickly search for the girl. On the spot, the police were calling for Barbara, and one of them could hear a very muffled knocking noise coming from the ground. Then, they started digging, but listen to this. They knew Barbara was buried, and they didn't even take simple digging equipment, like a shovel, for example. Nothing. They had to use their hands to save the girl, and after about 15 minutes of digging, they finally hit the glass box. While the police searched for and rescued Barbara, a team went out in search of the kidnappers. That same afternoon, the police received a call from a boat seller. Look, my name is Peter Cooper, and I just had a pretty weird situation here with me right now. A man showed up here and bought one of my boats paying cash, $2,240, just paying in $20 bills. The police went there, and with a serial number from the bills, they discovered that the buyer really was Gary. As he had bought a boat and had already gone out with it, it was harder to know where he had stopped. But on one of the nearby islands, the police found the boat, and inside it, a briefcase with several $20 bills. So it was clear that Gary was close. Looking for him all night in the middle of that island, he was finally found and surrendered. Now the search was on for Ruth. She managed to escape without leaving a trace. In February 1969, two months later, Ruth was hired to work at a hospital in Oklahoma. The hiring process included copying documents and reading fingerprints that were sent to a database for general analysis, but she did not know that this information would be sent elsewhere. So, on the 3rd of March, the arrest warrant came out, and with the address in hand, they managed to make the capture. Gary, raised in Alaska, started stealing at age 9. At age 14, he was convicted of car theft and placed in a Utah juvenile facility, but he didn't stay long. At age 18, he returned to prison in California for trying to steal another car. While in prison, he planned the perfect crime, locating and kidnapping an heir. He worked on how to communicate with the family and where to hide the victim while waiting for the money. He managed to escape prison by climbing the wall. With a very high IQ and a fake ID, he got a job as a research assistant at the Marine Science Institute in Miami. In 1968, age 23, he carried out this kidnapping. In May, the trial of the two was held. Gary was sentenced to life imprisonment for planning and executing the abduction, in addition to the desperate conditions Barbara was exposed to. He got parole after 10 years in prison and was able to study medicine in Indiana. In 2006, he was arrested for drug trafficking after sailing off the coast of Alabama with approximately $1 million of cocaine and four illegal immigrants. He was released on parole in 2010. And in 2012, 
he violated the requirements and returned to prison. Ruth managed to prove that she and Gary had broken up after the first rescue attempt had failed. She also didn't take any of the ransom money. Given this, she only got seven years in prison for participating in the execution of the kidnapping. After four years serving her sentence, she was granted parole, and upon leaving, was immediately deported to Honduras, her country of origin, in addition to being barred from entering the United States for 50 years. <laughs>